The Dukes of Dice are brought to you by Arcane Wonders, Game Toppers, Life Chaos, and listeners like you. Welcome to the Duchy. It's time for another episode of the Dukes of Dice podcast, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Coming to you from the Duchy in the Duke City, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the Gateway City, St. Louis, Missouri, it's... The Dukes of Dice, a podcast about board, card, and occasionally role-playing games. Today, the Dukes review Floodgate Games' Holy Festival of Colors. Then they take a look back at their review of It's a Wonderful World in their Dukes Double Take. And now, the Dukes of Dice. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Sean. And Alex. And this is episode 243, Technicolor. Technicolor, that name, thanks to the name father himself, Steve O'Rourke. We're talking about two games. We're talking about Holy Festival of Colors and our uh, look back at It's a Wonderful World. So he said, building up your futuristic empire's engine through scientific advancements, plus the vivid hues of the Hindu Festival of Holy. So that's Technicolor. Great job, Steve. So yeah, we get help naming all of our episodes from our amazing board game guild, which is guild number 2008. We've got some runner-up naming episode titles uh, that we'll give you at the end of the episode. Whew. Well, Alex, can you believe January's almost over? We're one-twelfth of the way through 2021. This has felt like a, a long month in many ways. <laughs> uh, and, and for me, it's proven to be a, a, a personally chaotic month, as, as I'll kind of talk about in a bit. Uh, how are you hanging in there, Sean? What, what's, uh, what's your January been like? It's, it's been busy. It's been very busy, Alex. I've probably mentioned this once or twice on the show, but typically January's are one of the biggest months for filing of divorces. And this January is no different. So I am, I am certainly keeping busy. Why do you think January is the biggest month for filing divorces? Is it just you're past the holidays? You've, you've stayed together for the kids and now it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's it. People are like, yeah, I'll, I'll just do what we can to get through the holidays. People don't want to be alone on the holidays. They don't want to separate in the holidays. They don't want, you know, there to be memories about, you know, associated with holidays. So, I mean, I think that's, that's probably my best guess. And I think I've probably read something to that effect somewhere. Um, but it, I mean, it makes a certain amount of sense. Also, people are getting, uh, you know, tax documents like the W-2s and 1099s. And so they know that they're going to get some sort of return a lot of times. And that's money to pay a divorce attorney. So good times, Alex. Good times. I earn my living from people's misery. Oh, Uh, well, that's dark. Uh, Other other than profiting from other people's misery. uh, How how are things going broadly? Dukes of Diet update. Anything? Anything cooking? Um, It's interesting you say cooking. I made a delicious, a delicious. uh, What's it called? What's it called? Oh, God. What's it called? I don't know. There's literally any dish you could be making my that smoker, could be described my as smoker. delicious. I made I made a fantastic, uh, a fantastic. Wow, this is terrible. What's it called? Fantastic. The big, the big fish giant fillet? beef. The fantastic. big giant beef. Is it meat? Is it meat it's related? Meat. It's beef. It's beef. Brisket. This is Did you make a brisket? brisket. Yeah. Let's let's do that again because that was really bad. That was like an hour and a half of me fumbling around. No, no, uh, we're keeping this in as is, sp- man. I'm speaking, down with that. Speaking. Speaking of cooking, Alex, I made a delicious 12 pound beef brisket, which came out beautifully, beautifully. Um, so Duke's diet, I am sitting at 260 um, things. So that's still up. Eh, it's not great. Um, but I've, I'm, I'm doing, I just had a great uh, keto fried rice that uses cauliflower rice. And, uh, you know, fish oil, soy sauce. It was, it was quite good. Not fish oil, fish, fish sauce. What is up with you and food? So, so listeners may or may not have heard, I don't know how Sean's going to edit this, but may or may not have heard Sean, uh, completely forgetting what brisket was. Uh, and, and now we're mixing up fish oil and, and fish sauce. What? Oh boy. This could be a long night tonight, huh? Let's move on. Let's talk about games, Alex. Well, before that, I, 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 a bunch of stuff going on which will kind of feed into games. It's kind of games adjacent. Well, yeah, eventually. I, thought, I thought that's how you had it set up on the, on the show notes, but that's I fine. did. I did, but there's another life update before that. Oh, okay. Which is today, 
uh, the day we're recording this, the Thursday, is my last day at my current job at Sapper Consulting, uh, uh, basically an email marketing firm out of St. Louis. Uh, and I am transitioning to uh, who was, I guess, now a former client, now my about to be current employer as of the day this episode drops, uh, a San Francisco-based accounting firm. So I'm not moving to San Francisco. So any Bay Area listeners, sorry, I'm not going to be any closer. I might come visit more often. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to be working for an accounting firm in, in business development. Uh, it came along pretty quickly, kind of started mid-December. I think I talked about it briefly on the show, mainly because my dad listened to an episode and told me not to talk about stuff before it's finalized on the show, <laughs> uh, which he's right, by the way. But uh, yeah. Hold on, uh, hold on, hold on. How often does your dad listen to the podcast? I don't think super frequently, which is why okay. I was very confused when he brought that up, but I, I don't know. Does he ever Does he ever say like, oh, that Sean sure is mean to you? It has not come up in conversation that way yet. So I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Dad, if you're listening, I love you. Uh, and thanks for listening and helping our downloads, I guess. Uh, thanks, Mr. Goldsmith. Yeah. Uh, so that's one big crazy life change. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, Abby and I are both looking for houses pretty aggressively. We're going to, to a bunch of open houses, working with an agent. Uh, I have... Tomorrow, basically the Friday, um, as of this recording, off, and I'll be going to, I'm scheduled for six or seven different showings of houses. Uh, so we're looking for a, a nice three-bedroom home here in St. Louis, and uh, we'll see if that comes together, but that's another big change going on. Uh, but yeah, this is where it kind of feeds into games, and I, I posted a thread on this on the Guild. Uh, it's on there as Cribbage and the Infinite Game, and... The reason I posted that is, I mean, just kind of short and sweet at the top, uh, my grandmother passed away. My, my last living grandparent um, is now gone. Uh, her name was Susan Goldsmith, my dad's mom. Uh, we all called her Bird. Bird was her uh, perpetual nickname. She was someone who really an adventurous spirit, uh, someone who independent, really stylish. Um, my grandpa passed away in the early 90s, so she spent multiple decades on her own, um, didn't back down, you know, went, took classes at Harvard and uh, had a beautiful home out on the Cape and played tennis and stayed active uh, and, and really just a, a wonderful woman. But part of the kind of the game's tie to this is, is when I found out she was um, uh, about to pass away, uh, got to, to say a few words to her, but I ordered the day that I learned that this was probably imminent, I ordered a handmade wooden cribbage board because growing up for summers out on the Cape, well, really, uh, most of the time we were together, that was a game we would come back to time and time again. She was a card shark. She loved playing bridge. Um, she she was a, a, a great cribbage player too. And for folks who don't know what cribbage is, I, I think it's unlikely, but yeah, maybe there's someone out there. Uh, it's a an old, old, old card game. Uh, there's a cribbage, there's a cribbage board that can get paired with it, but it's primarily a scoring system. You're you're trying to race to 121 points. First person who gets there, game ends, hard stop. Uh, you have a hand of six cards. You put two in uh, two in the crib. Your opponent puts two in the crib, or if you're playing with three players, you each put one. Uh, you take turns having possession of the crib and getting points that way. There's a, a section where you, you're playing cards back and forth. It's a, it's a wonderful game, and I learned it well before I learned of anything remotely in the hobby. Uh, and her love of cards and her love of those kinds of games, I think, at least in some parts, sparked my love of games too, was certainly a part of that. And things had come full circle. She she went from kind of teaching me and and being that presence to um, being someone in, in the later years. She had Parkinson's and, and had been on a, a slow but noticeable decline for the, for the past several years, was in transitional living, um, went into a memory unit at one point, uh, was, had, was not really herself and hadn't been herself for a while, which is part of why this isn't... It, didn't, it hasn't hit me all in one kind of giant burst. Uh, you know, this is something that, you, that it sort of has been felt spread out over a number of years. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I, some of my last memories with her were, were kind of playing through cribbage. You know, she was at a point where 
I was effectively playing both hands, right? It was, you know, kind of playing against myself a little bit, but it was still this wonderful time together. And uh, I literally received that cribbage board today. It's gorgeous, um, nice metal pegs. It's one I hope can kind of be a, a, a family heirloom or something I, I pass along to my kids and grandkids too and kind of keep the cycle of that game going. But uh, that's 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 the game that was on my mind. And and in fact, it was one that, that I played because Abby had not played cribbage. She played euchre growing up uh, being a, being a, uh, in the Midwest, but uh, not cribbage so much. So I, I got a chance to teach her that game. I anticipate we'll play more of it. She enjoyed it. Um, so just, just a nice time to reminisce and kind of a nice memory. So Sean, did you ever play games with, with your grandparents? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, let me say this first. You know, I, I read it, I read it first on Facebook and I saw you post it on the guild, very, very touching tribute. Um, and you know, condolences to you and your family. Um, you know, I know, I know even when it's expected, it's still hard and, and you know, this type of situation, um, you know, it's difficult too, because she wasn't the person that, that yeah. she was for a long time. And that's, and that's certainly tough, but no, I mean, my, my maternal, my maternal grandparents, they're, they're both still with us. Uh, both my paternal grandparents have passed, but I have always been really close with my maternal grandparents, Nana and grandpa. Um, grandpa's 92 and Nana's 90. Um, and I have, very early memories with with my grandmother we would play uh we play checkers a lot and then from a very early age uh you know my grandpa taught me poker blackjack and then started taking me to casinos when i was 14 um and so craps craps is something that he taught me to play craps and craps is something that we've we've really bonded over um and so uh, very fortunate to have both of them um and you know reading your story i had to take a second afterwards and and you always you know not to make this about me in any way shape or form but you always kind of internalize and and analogize and um so i know that's that's not going to be easy and uh so i'm definitely i'm i'm thinking of you and your family alex thanks sean uh it's it's so not uh obviously not this weekend but the following weekend we're going to have a zoom memorial uh, uh for her and i'm emceeing and hosting that which i'm uh honored to do but also you know kind of kind of uh freaking out just a little bit about just because i want to you know i want to be able to do her justice and sure um but it'll be nice hearing about her from other perspectives from her you know through her friend's eyes through uh extended family's eyes through other people's eyes because i knew her from this period of life after her husband had passed away and um you know i don't i don't know the person she was kind of before that period um i've i've heard bits and pieces since she passed and kind of other stories and um getting to know her in a different way, but it's, um, yeah, just kind of a, a reflective time. And, uh, yeah, thank you for the kind words and thank you for the kind words of everyone on the guild who'd, who'd responded already. Uh, I know this sparked memories for a lot of other people. Some, some folks had, had private messaged me reaching out and mentioned that, that cribbage specifically was a game that they had played with, with their grandparents. Uh, it was funny, Sean, as you mentioned craps, I was, I was thinking for whatever reason, that is the one game I have been taught it, or, or someone's attempted to teach it to me a couple of times. I think you did at one point yeah. when we were yeah. at, and I, it has not stuck with me at all. Uh, I, I still I couldn't really tell you what's going on in craps. <laughs> uh, maybe someday I'll actually play with money and and get a better understanding for what's going on with craps. I, I think it's probably a lot of fun, uh, but I've kind of stuck in the, 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 the blackjack waters when it comes right. to gambling. Anyway, so... That's my first game played that I that I wanted to talk about was uh, was cribbage and uh, yeah love you bird and uh, yeah I guess that's it on that so you know you think we would have learned lessons from the end of the year episode and <laughs> the ordering <laughs> yeah that's a <laughs> I thought of that but it also kind of fit in with kind of the typical beginning of show discussion and life updates kind of thing right. Uh, but yeah, you've got a good point. So yeah, all of this is going to seem a little bit silly for uh, for the rest of this, but oh well, that's kind of the nature of the show. So yeah, Sean, what have you been playing? <laughs> oh boy, what? Oh man, so much, so much stuff. Kind of, it's it's kind of been nice. You know what? It's not so much a, a gameplay, although I'm, I've got a couple games to talk about. Um, but I I have wanted to organize my magic collection for a while and and somewhat inventory. Um, because it's a pretty valuable 
asset. Uh, and so I found a website. It's called cardcastle.com. And you, you, you signed in there. Um, I'm paying like three bucks a month to have all of the features. And I think it's going to be well worth it. Uh, and then you download an app and you can actually scan in. Um, it recognizes the cards with your camera on your phone. So you download the app. And so I've been, I've been doing like one of my commander decks at a time and, and it scans it all in. It has, it's all there in, in the interface and it tells you, you know, current value, um, I can set up tags so I know like which of my decks have old sleeves that need to be replaced, which of my decks are unfinished and need to be updated. Um, really cool. It's been a really fun, fun thing that I do for an hour or two every night. Uh, I'm a little shocked how much value there is in this one box I have of 10 decks. Um, it is it is shocking. Yeah, I, it's just shocking. Um, all right. But that's been fun. Um, what should I talk about? I, I don't know that I want to talk about this game, Alex, but I will. I'll talk about, it's called Honey Buzz. Um, Alex, have you heard of Honey Buzz? I have heard of it and saw this game in its early stages because the designer, Paul Solomon, uh, would come into, uh, Gray Fox games, uh, nights. I mean, not for Gray Fox games, but he, he was, I think he did some work with Genius Games. He's a local St. Louis guy. Nice guy. I, I, I know him quite well. I paid him, interestingly enough, Sean, to make me a custom deck box of Keyforge for Smithison, the Immovable, uh -huh. uh, and then never actually picked up said deck box. Oh. So, uh, anyway, that's, yeah, that's, that's how I know Paul. So. You want me to send him an angrily worded letter from your attorney? No, I think it's unnecessary. I think I paid him five dollars, so oh, I, think, okay. I think we're okay. Well, all right, fair enough. Well, yeah, as as you said, it's designed by Paul. Is it Solomon? I, I think it's Solomon. Is how it's pronounced. Solomon. Yeah. Okay, and it's published by Elf Creek Games, and this is it's a really cute looking game. It's it's a honey bee economic game with a worker placement aspect, and you have your own personal honeycomb and you're going to be drafting tiles sort of it's part of the worker placement aspect where you're placing workers on certain spots that then give you these these uh double hex tiles that will then get incorporated into your hive and some of them have certain types of actions and you're basically trying to um to surround within your hive these actions to activate them and what you're doing with these various actions is some might give you money um, some might give you, uh, larva. So additional workers you have to place because it kind of has a, um, a worker placement mechanism similar to key forge. Nope. You just said it, uh, not key forge key flower. There we go. Key flower where you have to place subsequent worker or extra workers on a spot that already has one worker. So I need to play two and then three. Uh, until things get cleared. So there's a placement, and then you can also just recall on your turn. Um, and you have to, uh, there's there's an action that lets you go collect pollen, and there's four different types of pollen. And then there's actions that let you produce where your certain pollen or, or certain spots in your, your board will produce um, the, the honey that you need. And then there's a market where you can sell off the honey. And so you can sell one type of, of honey, uh, at a certain value, but then that value falls. It'll never rise. It'll just fall. And when a certain number hit the bottom, that's when the, that's one thing that might trigger the end game. The other thing is in addition to just being able to sell it, you can also, um, uh, fulfill orders. So you need two, two types of this particular honey, one type of this other particular honey. Um, and when those go away or those are fulfilled, that could also be an end game trigger. Um, so money really is the is the victory points of the game. There's also some like end game um, scoring objectives. There's also things that you can race for certain achievements during the game that award you points. This was interesting. Um, I ultimately I don't think I liked it. There were a lot of things to like about it. The production was really solid, um, very very cutesy, really interesting components. Um, for example, the <laughs> the honey looked like different colored, uh, like jellies or, or like gummies. Um, and they were, they were kind of soft. You kind of wanted to eat them. I don't know what it is between, you know, between that and Tide Pods that makes you, makes you want to just chomp right into them. 
lots to like about about the production, but in some ways, the production held the game back because there was so much going on in this game, and a turn was jumping through all these hoops, and it was hard to like. So, for example, the colors, the colors of these different types of honey are all within a couple hues of each other. Like very hard to distinguish at first, especially became a little bit easier to recognize. They're different shapes too, but they're still kind of these amorphous blobs. And so it, it made it, it made it a little bit difficult. Uh, I felt like there was one too many mechanics for this game and turns could take a while because you would have to go through this and check this and then this triggers and then the production happens and you're usually taking, if you're doing it right, uh, multiple actions in a single turn because hopefully you're activating multiple um, multiple spots in your in your honeycomb. So I think, I think there's certainly a place for this game for a lot of people. Um, it, I wasn't, I, I, li- I wanted to like it and, the, and I enjoyed the play, but it's not a game I'm eager to com- come back to necessarily. And I don't know if I would have liked it more if it had been a little bit of a cleaner production. You know, we talked about, uh, for example, Dune last week, uh, Dune Imperium, where it's a very functional board. There's not a lot of fluff with the graphic design. This is the opposite, right? Almost almost to the point, well, not almost to the point, I think to the point where uh, gameplay suffered because of it. I think it's worth checking out. It looks like, it would be something for young kids. It is not. There's quite a bit going on here. Um, and maybe maybe part of that expectation affected it too. Um, I played it four players, which, you know, I, I might be cajoled into playing it again at three players. But uh, but yeah, that's, that's Honey Buzz, Alex. Sean, what are the six most edible but not actually board games? So I think of I think of like Azul. Azul, yep. Some of those pieces look like Jolly Ranchers. Sure. Uh, sure. I think of of Wingspan. Those eggs could could be chocolate filled in theory, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, not to not to pump up Stonemeyer again in back to back weeks. Brought to you brought to you by Stonemeyer Games. Stonemeyer Games. It's in the game. Uh, what else would be an edible edible board game, but not really? Hmm. I I don't know, Alex. Yeah. You got me. You got me there. Do some research, I guess. Uh, I'm glad the game looks somewhat edible. I'm sorry it, was, it didn't live up to <laughs> expectations. Cool. Uh, next one I'll talk about is actually one that I played a, a good number of weeks ago, Sean, and uh, played it over the course of a weekend with Abby. Uh, this is in the Unlock series, which we've talked about before on the show, uh, but we specifically played Star Wars Unlock. Star mm-hmm. Wars Unlock. Sean, have you, have you played this, this Unlock bunch of games? I have not, no. Have you played any Unlock game? Yes, I played one. Okay. I forget which one, but I played one. Yeah. So Unlock, for folks who don't know, it's it's one of these escape room type experiences. What sets it apart from Exit is it's uh, you can pass it on to someone else. It's not replayable, but it's also not destroyed when you're done with it. Uh, so, and by the way, we played it uh, one of the new Exits that came out pretty recently. What is it? A Cemetery of the Night, I think is what it is. And oh man, that's one of the best ones yet, especially if you've played Exits before. I'm not talking about that though. I'm talking about Star Wars Unlock. Uh, it's assisted with an app on a phone and then a, and usually a, a deck of cards for a scenario is how Unlock works. Uh, Star Wars Unlock has three scenarios. So you have the Battle for Hoth. Uh, you have, oh, one that I'm forgetting in this moment. Oh, it's a prison escape. That's right, it's a prison escape. And then you have a third one, which is on some sort of planet. And I don't know which one. So the Star Wars is 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 fading from me. Um, the, the chief complaint with unlocks in the past for us has been it's been kind of obtuse or not not supremely obvious. We're really bad at them. Sometimes we'll solve them out of order. Uh, it, unlocks have been a bit of a mess for us as a series. They're enjoyable, but but frequently uh, we'll get pretty tangled up with them in a way that we don't with, say, exit games. The Star Wars one, what's nice about them is is they are a little bit easier. They incorporate a new mechanic into the unlock series where you have five different advantage cards might be more but at least five and you'll pick two of them which will give you hints for certain puzzles ahead of time so you might pick droid expertise and it might give you some hint related to a droid uh that comes up as as in one of the the clues which is a pretty cool way to kind of choose or feel like you have some agency at the start of the game uh to make a choice that will affect things all of the puzzles are solvable without any clues 
but it is nice having that little bit of extra direction in, in the form of the advantage cards. That was a, a mechanic we found really interesting. What we also liked is these are slightly easier puzzles as a whole than your typical unlocks. Your typical unlocks, again, because of the obtuseness or whatever reason, they just don't click with us. We tend to find harder than most of the exit games we play. These ones, that's not the case. Th these were not easy by any means, but more, more straightforward. And I will say the third scenario, the one that's on the, the desert planet, it, it involves a map. This isn't a spoiler. It's, it's just in the, the components of the game. But it involves a map and traveling around a map. And the way they execute that is super cool. Super cool. Uh, so that scenario specifically, I think, is the best unlock scenario I've played. And this set as a whole, especially if you like Star Wars, was really engaging. Um, if you're someone who really wants desperately hard puzzles, these aren't going to be desperately, desperately hard. This is solvable and, and solvable easier than most unlocks we've tried. Uh, but one I'd give a recommendation to, especially if you're, again, if you're a Star Wars fan. So that's Star Wars Unlock. Cool. That sounds pretty cool. Is it something... So because it's a little bit easier, do you think it's something where I could play with Chewie and she can, you know, catch on to certain things or would I be doing most of the heavy lifting? So here's the thing. I haven't seen Chewie in a good number of years at this <laughs> okay. point. I yeah. don't think I have a good, a good sense of her gaming capabilities because the last time I sure. saw her, my sense of her gaming capabilities was they were non-existent. Yeah. Uh, so I don't actually know, Sean. Um, I would say for most kids her age, probably a little bit too much, even with adult help. But you're Chewy, with enough gaming experience, it's possible. I, I wouldn't say it's completely out of the question. Um, might be fun to have her along as kind of like a co-pilot with this. Okay. So, like, for example, she can't beat me in Twilight Struggle, but she puts up a good fight. She's playing Twilight Struggle? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I don't know why I, was, I, don't know why I even bought into that for a second. <laughs> but you did fool me. So. Oh. Uh, fool you once. Fool me. You fooled me more than once in the, okay. over the course of this show. Well, cool. So what else have you been playing, Sean? Yeah, so I got in a play of Praga Kapu Regni, I believe is how you say it. And it's a game about building up medieval Prague. It is designed by Vladimir Sushi. Suchi, I believe? Suchi. Um, who is... he? I loved Underwater Cities. And, and I think he's a fantastic designer. So this is published by Delicious Games, or, or I guess that's more of the studio. So that's his, his studio that produces his games. That's something they put together. And then at least here in the U.S., uh, it's being distributed by Rio Grande Games, which is local here in New Mexico. So, so as I said, you are trying to build up uh, medieval, um, medieval Prague and you're doing this through a sort of rondelle action selection. I think there are six actions you can take. Um, you can get these upgrade tiles. You can build walls around your section of the city. You have your own little uh, personal board. And then you can also build uh, certain buildings out into the shared city space on the main board. You can also... Um, Let's see what it, oh, there's the King's Road, which is this path that you have a little worker that can move along, uh, get you certain bonuses uh, as you do that. And then you can also uh, trigger your gold and well, or stone production. Um, and there's two parts there. Either you're increasing your production or you're actually producing, um, getting a certain amount of stone and, and gold uh, or, and some other bonuses as your, your production increases. So what I found really interesting was this rondelle action selection. So there is this, this wheel uh, at the top right corner of the board and these little hex pieces to, oh, it's kind of like honey, uh, honey buzz. Huh. They have similar, similar pieces. Hmm. So they, one end fits in the wheel, kind of like their, their spokes almost. Um, and the board will rotate. You, or the, the wheel will rotate, you pick one of the available actions um, or one of the tiles, and on each tile there are two actions. You pick which one you're going to use. And depending on where the tile is on, on the wheel, you may have to pay money to use it, or you may get points if it's kind of ridden along uh, a little bit longer. And, and then once your turn is over, you're going to place that tile kind of at the, at the back end where it's going to be more expensive if someone wants to take it right away, then the, the wheel rotates. And that's how you keep track of the number of rounds and turns, and et cetera. 
Um, so what I found really interesting about this game and what I think you would like about this game is it's, there's a lot of different paths to victory. I, I ignored certain things and did other things and ultimately didn't work out super great for me, but I had a lot of fun with the moving pieces. Uh, so I talked about, for example, there's, uh, there's a, an upgrade action that you take where you have in your, your little, um, your, your individual board, that's all these hexes, you have the different main actions that are shown and you can replace those main actions with these upgrades, which might give you some sort of an ability like, okay, when you take this action, you can also pay a stone to get two gold, for example. Uh, and there's different ages of, of these buildings and these, these upgrades and they get more powerful in the later age. And there's also a, a tile placement aspect because there are certain things on the corners of the hexes or on the sides of the hexes, where if you meet them up, you're going to get certain bonuses, additional resources, um, or you might get these, these red and blue, um, end game scoring bonuses. I mean, there was a ton going on when I talked about honey buzz having like one too many mechanics. It sounds crazy because this game has got like 14 times the mechanics that honey buzz does, but it's, you're kind of expecting that for this, uh, you know, a heavier, a heavier Euro game. Um, you're also, like I said, adding walls to the outside of your individual board. Those are, again, going to give you some sort of bonuses when you place them. If you connect them in certain ways, you can get other bonuses. Potentially, it's going to have you move up on, I think it's the fort track, which the game comes with these really cool 3D ascending stairs for the fort and the cathedral, which is another track. There's just, there's tracks galore in this game, Alex. Just, just insane. Um, you're able to kind of combo things together. If you are able to collect enough, uh, gold windows and silver windows, you're able to take free actions. I mean, there's, there is a ton going on here. I don't want to get too much into it because there's a chance we might do this as a featured review sooner rather than later. I, I I'm not, I don't think you're going to love it. You're definitely not going to hate it. What I, what I like is the, the individual turns are fairly intuitive. Like, when you're, when you're done learning the rules, you're like, very cool. I, I know how to play, but I don't know what I should be doing. And, and I enjoy that. I enjoy that, that discovery of, of what works well and what doesn't. You definitely have to specialize in this game, but you still need to kind of do enough because everything kind of supports one another. It's pretty crazy. And if we do a featured review of this, man, I don't know what a rules overview is going to look like. I'll have, to, I'll have to prepare something ahead of time because even that was a little rambling and I feel like I barely scratched the surface. But so far, I'm very happy with this game, and I'm very eager to play it again, um, and I will probably be looking for a copy for, for us to have here at home. I will say, Sean, I was, I was tempted to, or you told me to scoop it up just a little bit too late, because I was in-store at Miniature Market, and at the time, they had a decent number of copies and available at a very deep discount. So uh, all I took away from your explanation, by the way, Game is in Prague. Yep. And has a lot of tracks. Sure does. All right. So yeah, that is Praga Regni. No, sorry, Praga Caput Regni from Rio Grande Games, at least here in the US. Well, we're gonna skip out on news this week in order to give Sean's editing fingers a little bit of a rest, but after the break, holy festival of colors. Well, we talked a lot the last couple episodes about the Freedom 5 Kickstarter that was up from our friends over at ArcaneWonders.com. And shucks, wouldn't you know it, the campaign is over. A very successful campaign. They had almost a million dollars in pledges, $944,247. Oh my goodness, that's so much money. Now, don't fret though, because if you didn't back in time, you can still do a late pledge. You can get the Citizen Pledge for $49. You can do the Hero Pledge, which is for the Kickstarter Exclusive Edition for $109. So head on over to freedom5game.com. That's freedom5, F-I-V-E, game.com. That'll send you over to their Late Pledge site where you can take a look at all the different options for getting in a Late Pledge. Uh, not sure how long this is going to be up and running for, so I would say hurry, act now. Definitely check it out. That's freedom5game.com. 
Additionally, check out all of Arcane Wonders' other awesome titles at arcanewonders.com. All right, go check it out. Sean. <laughs> Why do all of our ads have to stop, <laughs> or start rather? Why do all of our ads have to start with one of us saying the other person's name? Alex, do people not know what they're listening to? And do they not recognize how distinct your voice is from my voice? Well, Alex, I think that we're completely distinct as human beings and individuals. I agree. For example, Sean, which is which is you, not me, you have a very lovely game topper, do you not? I do, in fact, Alex, have a wonderful game topper. I enjoy it so very much. Uh, it, it's something where I don't have to have a, a full-on, all-purpose, all-the-time game table. I can have a game table when I want a game table and have a normal table when I don't want a game table. So, Sean, I hear that, <laughs> well, well, shoot, the Kickstarter's over, right? The Kickstarter's been over for, like, what, six months? How on earth can I get my own game topper, Sean? Well, Alex, it turns out it's not too late. You can go to Game Topper's website at GameToppersLLC.com, and there are still some toppers you can get. Some of the packages have already sold out, but there's still some things out there. Uh, you get a Baker Street bundle. You can get some of their amazing thematic game mats. Sean, I, I got a little secret for you. Is it? Is the secret... Uh, Wait, is, is no, the, Alex. Alex, I have a secret, secret for Sean, you. Sean, based on this fact that our buddy Berkey is a very industrious fellow... It is, in fact, Alex, that our friend Perky is a very industrious fellow. And keep your keep your ears peeled, Alex. There's another Kickstarter coming later in 2021. Should I keep them peeled or should I keep my ears to the ground? You should keep them somewhere where they're going to be able to hear this news. Okay, fair enough. Well, if you want to learn more about Game Toppers and the awesome products that they have, you should head on over to GameToppersLLC.com. It's always a showstopper when you're playing on a Game Topper. <music> Loud festivals and big crowds. Now, those are things that aren't so much of a thing right now during the pandemic, but it doesn't mean you can't have a little taste of the experience at home. The new release, Holy Festival of Colors from Floodgate Games, aims to capture that experience, a colorful festival in the heart of India. But does it actually deliver on the fun, or is this a colorful game without a lot to it? We'll tell you. All right, Alex. Well, as you said, Holy is published by Floodgate Games. It's designed by Julio E. Nazario with art by Vincent Dutre. And in Holy... Players gain joy, also known as points, by throwing color on the boards. Higher levels are worth more points. Uh, you can get color on other players and from collecting sweets. The player with the most points after each player can no longer throw color wins the game. So let's talk about this board. So it has these clear plastic trays that are a six by six grid. These are uh, produced by game trays. So if you're familiar a, a with that. A proud St. Louis company, by the way. Yeah. And so basically there are three levels of these boards. And it's, it's I don't know, probably a nine inch, 10 inch uh, tall board or, or tall collection. You've got uh, these pillars on the four corners that kind of hold it together. You do have to disassemble and reassemble whenever you're done playing or want to play it again. Um, and then there's also a, a letter and number grid so that you can more easily reference um, which spot corresponds above or below. So the way the game is set up is you are going to get one of your player markers, uh, four different colors, and you're going to start in one of the corners on the bottom board. Uh, additionally, different spots for different players. Additionally, there are these sweet tokens that are going to get placed. There's a bunch that are placed on the bottom of the board in a fairly, uh, straightforward pattern and then there's fewer that get placed on the second level and then there's none that are placed on the top level now you care about these because basically you're going to score five points uh if you have more sweets at the end of the game than, than other players but that's that's just one of the aspects of scoring so on your turn what you're going to do is you're going to play a card from your hand so everybody has their own deck of cards and these color cards 
are, are uh, basically a three by three grid. And most of them have, uh, in that three by three grid, they have three squares of your color. Um, and then there are other types of cards where there are three squares of your color and then a, uh, like a flower marker. And I'll explain how that works in a second. But basically, you're going to play a card in some way, shape, or fashion, which represents you throwing, uh, it's basically like cornstarch and food coloring of some kind in the actual festival. So this represents you throwing that. Additionally, you can move to any free space on the board, picking up any candy or, uh, or other of these color tokens wherever you land. And you can also move up uh, a level. You can't go down. So the moving around and the moving up are optional. And you can only move up if you are surrounded on all four orthogonal sides by color tokens. Now, these actions you can perform in any order. So you don't have to do anything first. So let's talk again about throwing the color. So basically, if it's one of the standard color cards, you pick which of the three colored squares is representing your marker, and you can rotate it as you need the card as you need to, and then you're going to place the color uh, in the corresponding spots on that card, uh, on, on the board rather, for, for the card. Now, it has to be done in such a way that you can't have color, color, excuse me, color cover another color token. You can't have it color candy, but, and you can also have it land on someone's head. You, you got them, you nailed them. And so in that moment, you get a point, which is pretty awesome. But also for every, um, oh, they're going to keep that token, by the way. So for every token that you have in another player's supply at the end of the game, you're going to get two points. All right. So what's really cool too, is as you ascend, you could only have the color land on the higher levels if the corresponding spaces below them are already uh, covered with color, meaning that if they're not, the color is going to fall through that floor to the bottom level. Something interesting to, to think about. So you're going to keep doing this until either you run out of color to throw or there's no legal places for you to, uh, to, to throw your color. But the game only ends for you. Everyone can keep playing until they can't play anymore. I should also point out that you are allowed to have up to three of these rivalry cards. Uh, it says if you don't want them, you don't have to have them, or you can have a fewer number. But basically, there are different, uh, different ways to score. There's some different twists on the rules. And for my, for, my, for my gameplay purposes, I liked having a bunch of these. I thought they made, they made each game very different, very unique. Um, but yeah, at the end of the game, you're going to add up points. So any color tokens you have in the top layer are worth three. The middle level is worth two. Bottom level is worth one. Any bonuses for the rivalry cards. And then also for having more, uh, more candy than other players. So that is how you play Holy Festival of Colors. Alex Goldsmith. Yes. Esquire. Not really. I'm glad you, no, not an Esquire. Uh, I'm glad you distinguished between the other Alex currently recording this podcast. That was very helpful. I'm happy to help, Alex. Yeah, you're going to ask Goldsmith. me about my, my my initial impressions of this one, though, right? I suppose I was. So we picked this one to review when we were on, I think it was after a Dungeons & Dragons game. And we were just kind of sitting on the line trying to figure out what's next. Because we we kind of plan things a little bit irregularly here at the Dukes of Dice, uh, where we might plan out a couple of games in advance. And then by the time the next review comes up, oh, we're scrambling and then we get the next couple lined up and then we'll catch up and whatever else. When we used to do this show weekly, by the way, there was more of an overlap. You could kind of plan things out a little bit more and start playing this one, but also get plays of that one. And it was a different, it was a different world, Sean. It was, uh, we were younger then and, and much dumber, much dumber. Uh, so my first impression of this was it's gorgeous. Uh, it looks fascinating i think this is going to have killer table presence uh and the publisher of this is uh is is one that i respect uh I, they also did sagrada if i'm not mistaken correct i believe so yeah so i i know that they they can put together a pretty decent board game so i i, I appreciate their taste broadly speaking uh and so all of those factors combined the one thing that had me worried going into this game sean was I knew I'd have to get some plays of this with Abby. And in fact, all of my plays of this were two-player with Abby. There will be, as we'll discuss, I think more in gameplay, a big, big, big quarantine caveat with this game, in my mind. 
Um, I My fear was this looked awfully chess-like or like it could be chess-like. And she mm -hmm. has not liked anything resembling chess, whether that be Onitama or chess itself or games uh, like War Chess that can kind of feel a little bit like chess. Um, because of that, I was a little bit worried going in. But those were my initial impressions. Looks gorgeous. I respect the publisher. Was curious to try it. Yeah. So I remember seeing this at Empire leading up to the holidays. And I, I picked it up, took a look at the back. And I'm like, all right, that looks all right. It wasn't something that, that necessarily caught my attention in terms of what I just saw in the back. I didn't even really read it that much. I just looked at, at the components on the back of the box. I'm like, that looks cool, but eh, it's probably not, not my, my jam. And so when this came up, I said, oh, yeah, they've got an empire. That's fine. I'll, 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 I'll pick it up. And it was funny because when uh, I mentioned it to Rory, he's like, oh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think you'd be interested in that. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm not really that interested in it. He's like, yeah, I mean, I just figure for a dexterity game. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> um, okay. I didn't think it was. Oh, it's Rory. not. It's oh, not, by the way. No. Well, I'm sure he read like on the back, like, you are throwing colors at other players. and Thema It's thematically a I, dexterity I, game. I, yes, I know. Don't get mad at me. Man. And so, so I opened up the rules and I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, wait, what? No, this is, this is an abstract. This is a, uh, a tactical abstract game. And so that piques my interest a little bit more. Okay, good. Cause when he, I mean, when he told me it was a dexterity game, I was just like, oh, what did, what did I get myself into? Um, but no, I, so I had the completely wrong expectations for this game. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's, that's how I came into this review, Alex. Okay. Yeah. Nowhere, I, I, to, nowhere to go, but up my, my impression of this game was not that it would ever be a Sean game. What, why is that? I'm curious. Cause I like, I like tactical, uh, abstract games. Like a lot of the games you just mentioned are games that I enjoy quite a bit. At least the look and feel of the game. Okay. Even though it's, again, it, I, I had this fear of it being very chess-like, the look and feel of it struck me as something that was lighter or on the lighter end of the scale. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that weight of game, I was, I was skeptical about how much you would enjoy it. And okay. I texted you a prediction for your score. I'm curious as we talk through this how close I was, was to your actual score. So I don't remember that at all, but let's save that for the end. I'll go back through my text here. Okay. Yeah, no worries. You don't have to go back too far. We don't text that much. So... Uh, anyway, uh, rules, Sean, I, uh, I, I did learn this one purely from the rule book, purely from the rule book. Wow. And what did you find my score? No, not, no, no. I just meant like, wow, you learned it from the rule book. Well, this is not, this is not, you know, this is not, I guess, Pulsar 2849, or this isn't a, like, this is not that complicated of a game. I don't tend to learn games from the rule book. I did in this case. It did the job for teaching me the game, but I'm going to throw out a couple of caveats here. Something in how this rulebook was written had me not really grasp the game or the point of what you were doing or why you were doing it until mm -hmm. the very end of the rulebook and scoring. It was one of those where you read mm -hmm. through, you get a sense of the mechanics, but I didn't quite, it didn't pull together in my mind until I read final scoring. I didn't get the why behind anything, if that makes, makes a degree of sense. That's one piece of things. Um, the other one, though, Sean, is not something in the rulebook itself that bugged me. So you mentioned the rivalry cards themselves. And these are, these are cards that change the rules in, in some ways. So it changes the rules uh, in terms of, um, you know, it, it could affect your movement. It could affect um, how, how you score points, how much things are worth, th that sort of thing. But there are some things on those cards that, that are unclear to me. And I'll give you an example. It's actually a card I really enjoyed in this game. So typically your movement is not really restricted. You can go anywhere on the floor that's open that's not occupied by another player's piece. Uh, you can move wherever you want. Movement is very, very fluid and free in this game. Uh, maybe to its detriment, maybe not. But, but um, there's one card that changes that, which is the card Walk. Sean, did you play any games with a Walk card in play? No, that doesn't sound familiar. So walk says you can only move one space on the board instead of oh, anywhere on no. the board you want. Or you can spend a sweets token if you'd like to move up to two spaces. Well, not up yeah. to. You would move two spaces. There's no reason to do it otherwise. Uh, but what's not clear 
and maybe it's in the rule book and I missed it. I, I looked for a section in the back where it'd be like, the rivalry card's explained. Uh, the card itself doesn't spell out whether that that's one space just orthogonally of movement or one space both orthogonally and diagonally. Mm. And so Abby and I played it with a loose interpretation that you could move diagonally or orthogonally, that that we, we kind of played with the looser. And I think that's probably the better way to play it. But it's also unclear, for instance, this is not normally a factor, right? You only make one move in a game, right? And it's a very distinct, you just move anywhere, you teleport on the board wherever you want, wherever you land on, you pick up. Well, if I'm spending a sweets token to move two spaces, do I stop in between? So if I run over this sweets token and then move to another one by spending a sweets token to take another move, do I collect both of the spaces Mm. I go through? Or do I just collect on the final space I go to? Mechanically, we played it as, because in general the movement is, whatever you land on, you get. We played it where you only get the second thing you land on. Yeah, That's how we played it. But that there's a little bit too much ambiguity in that. Um, and, and now, I understand a little bit as to why. It's, it's an optional rule, technically speaking. It's a variant on the game. But as you mentioned in the introduction, I think it's such a key variant to this game that I think you need to have that stuff ironed out, crystal clear, no room for interpretation. Uh, and it just comes from the, you know, when you change the base rules that much, when you go from completely free movement, so orthogonally and diagonally doesn't even come to, into a, to anyone's mind, to restricted movement, you lose out on some stuff there. And there were, there were a couple of other little instances of just some confusion and, and sort of having to interpret things. Um, nothing, nothing game breaking. Uh, I will, I will also say, Sean, and this is fine. The fact that you can have your color piece, um, share a space with a sweets token, Mm -hmm. but if it shares a space with a sweets token on the second level, does it fall through? It does fall through if you read through clearly, but the, the interaction with, with when you put out color and, and what it does with sweets tokens and some of those kinds of things slightly unclear for my liking. So, uh, broadly speaking, I think it did a good job as a rule book. Uh, it does have, uh, Sean, I, I, I'm going to guess your criticism. I've been speaking for a while here. Too big of a rule book? You mean in terms of size? Yeah. No, it's, it's fine. It's not oh, the okay. square. It's not the big giant square. I thought it no, was I, a big giant square rule book. Am I, am no, I, oh, no, okay. I'm, I'm looking at it. No, right I believe here. you. Yeah. Yeah. You're prepared. All right. Fair enough. Uh, never mind. Not big giant square. <laughs> your thoughts on the rule, Sean. I've talked for a while here. Can I say first, the rule book, it's all linen paper. Yeah, it's a nice like rule it's book. Really, nice, nice paper really, quality. It's really nice. Um, so there's a there's a bit of big walls of text, although at least it's in columns, which helps break things down a little bit more. Um, there's some, some cutouts in yellow that are notes. Um, really excellent diagrams, pictures, examples, things like that. What I, you know, I, I agree with you that I, I hate when at least some brief overview of scoring isn't kind of upfront because you're, you're right. You need the why, why am I doing all of these things? And maybe there could be a more detailed thing at the end. What I typically do is I'll typically do a very quick skim, like a 30 second skim kind of flipping through the pages. And on, on one of the last pages here, there's this really nice chart. Um, that's basically half of, I think the last page where it, it breaks down in a very visual style, what you get the points for. And so kind of before I did my actual read of the rule book, I, I saw that. And so I think that helped. Um, it would, that probably should be at the beginning. And, and I think for a lot, of, a lot of publishers, I think giving that rationale, like, yeah, giving that rationale up, up in front is, is useful and it provides context to make your rules more understandable. So, but yeah. yeah. But overall, I really like the linen, linen finish on the rule book. Well, that's art and components. That's I didn't talk well, about that there. No, it's it's rule book. The rule book is literally linen, linen finish. All right, art and components. The rule book's really nice. I like the linen finish on the rule book. <laughs> that's fine. I'll just edit that and move that into the rule book section. Okay, good, excellent. <laughs> um, uh, broadly speaking, it's I I think it did a fantastic job on components. You have these these lovely wooden player marker pieces. Uh, you have these unique shapes for the different colors. Mm-hmm. The uh, the visual look of that 3D board. Oh man, I'm so bummed for Floodgate that the conventions aren't happening right now. Oh, because no. this would be a 
you set this thing up on a table, people will stop in their tracks. And yep. they, and you you don't have to do a ton else. You don't have to have a ton of other displays. People will see that and they want to engage. I saw this all the time with photosynthesis, right? At at, at like Dice mm -hmm. Tower Con. You see photosynthesis set up, it draws a crowd. You see this one set up, it will draw a crowd. Yeah. And visually, it looks great. Uh, the the plastic trays are of a decent quality. The the insert is is mostly well done. It's not completely clear to me exactly how you're supposed to kind of put the like the wooden pieces where those go, uh, but it's functional enough. It all it all seems to fit in decently well, uh, and again looks stunning when it's all when it's all set up and good to go. Uh, I I will tell you, Sean, I thought the grid system was going to be more necessary in terms of like A3 or whatever else, but mm -hmm. because of the way they've set up the grids, because they have those references in the middle of the grids. You kind of know where spaces are without having to reference that, at least in my experience. Well, I think that may be differences in spatial awareness and spatial reasoning. Um, yeah. For example, Raquel and I needed the grid. Like it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like, oh, we're completely off, but it was definitely a nice, uh, a nice aid. And I'm, and I'm glad it was there. I, I found myself using it quite a bit. Interesting. Okay. But but I also think in terms of like spatial reasoning in games like this, that uh, that's not my strong suit. Um, it, it really isn't, especially where there's kind of a 3D element to it. Sean, did you did you enjoy the production of this as a whole? Yes, uh -oh. as a whole, I, I agree with you. I really like the the player markers. They're they're screen printed. They're, one of them is um, is a peacock, and then there's an elephant. And is it a, is it a crocodile? I think so. Maybe a, maybe a snake. And I, I mean, I think, I think component wise, this is great. And I agree with everything you said. The table presence on this is extraordinary. Here's what I didn't like. I didn't like having to build the board. Yeah. And it's like, this could almost bring it down a full point. Wow. Because for th for this kind of abstract game for this weight of game i we're talking about our gold our gold room score basically yep. where it was too much work to set up and it would it would be a couple attempts to put it together at least for me really yeah oh i didn't didn't that wasn't that hard cuz they kind of show you how to like set it up on its side and like roll it as you go yeah yeah eh. i didn't struggle it, with that part I, I, here's what I'll say. I agree with you in that for a two-player game of this, yeah. and if you were just to play one round of this at two players, that setup is a little bit annoying. Sure. Setting up that board. It's unavoidable. Like This is, this is something where in order to have this look the way it does, you have to do it this way. Um, and there's some elements that stay together, right? The, the, the grid system stays in place. Uh, and they have the insert set up in a way that makes it as easy as possible. But yeah, I can get. I could see how that could be annoying. I didn't have problems assembling it, maybe the way you did. Um, yeah. But Sean, I think for this thing specifically, how many did you ever play this more than two? No. So that's my quarantine caveat. I yep. Only played it at two, but I really want to play this at higher player count. I and really. I, by want the way, to. I think this setup issue becomes less of a factor if you play this at three or four. Yeah, I could see that. I, I mean. Yeah, yeah, probably. Because the game length is going to increase. And the, the feel of the, the thinkiness of the game is going to increase because there's a lot more to account for. Mm -hmm. I think if you have this at a higher player count, I think that problem is not as much of a problem. I agree with you in principle that that's, it's a lot of setup for what the game is. I, I didn't find it as bad as you're describing, though, if I'm honest. Well, the big problem I had, even even rotating it like I was, is the the grid inlays would keep falling out. Oh, like really? there's ways to secure them, like it's yeah. little, you know. But even when I thought they were in completely, sometimes they would just fall out. And I, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't terrible, but like think of a game like Onitama. Onitama, you're set up in you know no time whatsoever. Two seconds, sure. Yeah. I did. I had no problems at all with the pieces falling out of the of the grid once they were in. No problems. Did not happen. Uh, and setup was not a cinch, but it. Yeah, again, I didn't. I didn't have the same level of issue that you, you're describing. So that's interesting. 
Interesting. Well, guess I've just got some problems, Alex. Yeah, fair enough. Overall, though, I would say, uh, uh, and by the way, we didn't even talk about the box. The box is stunning on this game. Uh, the spot UV that they use to kind of have the little splashes of color mm-hmm. stand out a little bit more. It looks really good on the shelf. Uh, the shelf appeal of this game will, regardless of the score I give it gameplay-wise, likely keep it in the collection longer than than a, another game of this quality, but with a, a worse box would would do. So I think, broadly speaking, it's a win on a, on a production standpoint, at least in my book. And, and and I agree. I mean, if I, you know, if I had, if I had a house with like a gaming loft, this is, this is what I want long-term, right? I want several game tables, you know, more space for the collection. I'd have card tables set up so that we could have magic tournaments or, or cube draft or whatever. And then I'd have like something like this, because I enjoyed this game quite a bit. I would have something like this set up so I don't have to continually building it, have other have like the climbers on the table and have other yeah. things like, you know what I mean? But for whatever reason that like putting this together, I'm, I'm quick, quick. talk about, talk about princess in the P man. Yeah. It, it bugged me. It, it bugged me. Quick, quick life question. Uh-huh. You've been, you've been, I'm not, I was about to say the address of your house, uh, which was <laughs> yeah, a bad idea, don't. but you've been in that address in Albuquerque for a good chunk of time now. Decent chunk of time. Uh, are are you looking years. at moving? Yeah, you no, look- we're not. We're not looking to move anytime soon. Wait, only six years? Yeah, six years. Really? Yep. Man, feels like way longer. Nope, six years. Life is weird. Yep. Time we is moved weird. in. We moved in when Raquel was pregnant with Chewy, and she's going to be seven in April. So that makes sense. Man, yeah. that's also crazy too. Thinking of Chewy at seven. All right. Anyway. Yeah. Tell me about uh, it. All right. Fair enough. I hope you get your gaming loft someday, Sean. Yeah. Someday. 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 Gameplay. This is this is where I was was wondering if the game would fall flat for you. This is where I, I actually thought the bigger concern was more. I, I'm surprised to hear that there was as big of a concern on components because I thought gameplay was where you would have more questions on this one. So, Sean, what what did you think of this as a as a gameplay experience? So here's here's how I would describe it, and and I don't want to. This isn't the best comparison. This felt like it could be again because i haven't played three or four players multiplayer onatama yeah okay and when i and when i say that i don't want to give the wrong impression you're not you're not capturing pieces you're not trying to necessarily secure your opponents uh that that spot at the end um you know onatama is is very much a chess analog because you're moving multiple pieces trying to capture uh that's not this but in terms of in terms of the card play, um, it just it, it would give me that that kind of feel. And so, if you know, if I had if two people said, "Hey, we love Onitama. Is there something like it that we could play with with more players?" I'd be like, "Boom! Holy, you're all set." So I I liked this. There was a very interesting puzzle to this game. You know, early on, especially just at two players. You're just throwing your color around, no big deal. But then you're really trying to figure out, okay, can I can I snag a hit on this other person? Especially, you know, we had we had the rule where I think it was uh, your color and an opponent's uh, and an opponent's supply is worth four, uh, double at the end of the game instead of two yeah. points. It's it's four points, and so that that in that particular game made me prioritize trying to make that happen. And then you're trying to set yourself up for when can I ascend? You don't want to ascend super early because if there's not enough stuff below, a lot of your tokens are going to fall through the floor and that's not really profiting you. Um, and then there's an interesting decision. Okay. So am I best off just throwing where I'm at and then moving? Am I better off moving first? Am I better off ascending now? But then when you, you know, when you ascend, especially first, second level, you're giving up on all of those candy tokens that are at the bottom. Cause basically the, so the candy tokens occupy the same spots on level one and two, except on level two, there's only one token in each spot. Level one, there are two in each in each spot. And so there's just, there's a lot of interesting decisions and it's very much a, a tactical game. But I did feel like I was trying to plan ahead for for at least a couple turns in advance. I I was very surprised how much I enjoyed this game. 
what's what I've I really enjoyed about this one, Sean, is how different games can feel depending on the set of rivalry cards you have in play. Yes. Yes. So as an example, the first game we played of this, we played with a set of rules where things on the top level were worth four points instead of three. And you got bonus points if you had one of your color tokens directly on top of or above uh, another one of your own color tokens. So that encouraged yeah. more climbing and encouraged more vertical play. Uh, we had more direct hits in that game just to kind of tag people with color. We were kind of feeling things out. Movement was much more fluid and free. We didn't have that walk card in play. And then the next game, we played with the following rules. Uh, your color in a corner is yeah. worth double what it would normally be. Yeah. Whoever has more of the most of their color on the bottom level gets 10 points, a 10 point bonus. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, and the walk and the walk, the restricted movement. And on that one, we barely got to the second level. It was a knife fight oh. on the bottom floor and it ended up tied. And it was just sort of whoever had more up in the kind of corners on the, on the second level was who won. I, I, won, I edged Abby out by a little bit in that game. But those game, those game experiences were 100% different. The feel of those games was 100% different. And it came from this kind of hot swapping of, of rules. I don't know how many of these rivalry cards are in the game, Sean. Mm -hmm. I, I tended to handpick them instead of kind of randomly dealing them out. I don't know if you did something similar or not but I picked ones that seemed interesting. No, there, so there's 21 of them and, and we kept it random um, except for if we pulled something we had had before, we, we pulled it out. And, and so we can only see new ones. There was a, a smart design decision made with this one too, Sean, where with direct hits, if I were to directly hit your character, that could be a feel bad moment or a moment of like, oh, you're ganging up on me. You keep pegging me with your color. Or this is really annoying and whatever else. There might be a rivalry card that changes this, but in the, at least in the base core rules of the game, if I hit you with color, that's not something that holds you back or hurts you really in any way. It's just something that benefits me. Yeah, so there is one rivalry card that says whenever you hit someone with color, they have to give you one of their sweet tokens. Yeah, okay, yep, yep. And we did but play with that. In the, in, the base, in the base rule set, at least, that framing... Because it could, it, mathematically, it's effectively the same in a two-player game, not so much in a, a higher player count game. But the fact that it's a positive thing, that it's more of a playful, we're playing with color, it's a festival, we're running around trying to, to smack each other with these, these things. That playful element carries through, and we'll talk about that more in theme, but that had the game feel more playful than, you know, life or death. Um, you still wanted to have positioning, but it didn't feel mean. The game didn't feel mean to me which I thought was actually a, a strong positive. So there's also color dodge that gives you minus one point for each color token and another player got on you at the end of the game. Yeah, okay. So that would be another <laughs> another way where it would be more negative. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know, Alex. Is there, I mean, it's kind of hard to, <laughs> to go much more in depth on, on a lot of abstract games. It's true. Uh, I, I will say this, Sean. I think more than any other game we've talked about over this past almost a year at this point, mm -hmm. I think this game specifically needs one of the bigger quarantine caveats we've placed. I think this would feel completely different at three or four in a really yes. interesting way. A yeah. really interesting way. Uh, yeah, I, I think so too. I, I really regret not being able to play this at three, or three and four. I, I think... And and I think I'd almost rather play this at four than three because you'll have one person kind of sandwiched in between the middle. I don't know how big of a deal that is, especially since you can just kind of move. Um, but I really, I really enjoyed the puzzle of not just trying to maximize my points, but to also cut things off for, for Raquel so that she had to go out earlier, uh, which, you know, it, but yeah, I, I agree with you. Three or four, I think this game benefits from greatly. I don't think this is necessarily a great dueling game, head to head. Yeah, it's not bad I enjoyed by it, any means. But I enjoyed it well. I mean, I enjoyed it quite a bit still. Yeah, I enjoyed it quite a bit still. And I think the chaos of this and the playfulness of this really would emerge more at higher player counts. Yeah. Just playing it at two, you don't feel that as much. 
And with four, it just opens up that puzzle in such a unique way. You have less control over the situation and you can kind of embrace the chaos, look for these weird opportunities, how color falls, people climbing and clawing and trying to get up to that top level sooner. I, I think... I think this game would really shine at three and four. Probably four would be the ideal count I would recommend too. And it's a shame that I that because of the pandemic, we didn't have a chance to play it. I, I hope by the time we hit the double take, and this is a, a tip off to my score a little bit, I hope that I will have had to had a had a chance to play this at higher player counts. Yeah. So No, I I, I agree. I agree. Okay. Uh theme. Did did this did this and I kind of talked a little bit about this. I I felt it really did capture this this festival, this kind of running around, throwing color at each other. Um, the 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 visual look of the game played into it, but again, that playfulness for the most part is there, and and the characters fed into it. Um, at least from what I know about this, the festival from kind of some quick research, it, it seems to capture that in, in spirit at least in a, in a positive way. <laughs> well, have you? I mean, had you seen video of the festival? Before. I had, yeah. 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 So I, I think you're right. I think there's a sort of, sort of essence that's captured here. Obviously it's very much an abstract game, but you know, I, I think, I think it carried through well enough. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we've got one guild thought on this came from Brett Mowers. Brett said, we just picked this one up around the holidays. The deluxe version has amazing components and table presence. We've only played two players, but enjoyed throwing color at each other, which tied in nicely thematically, and the puzzle of planning out when to ascend and how to keep tokens on the higher tiers. After a couple plays, this one is a high four, perhaps even a low five. Very nice. Sean, I predicted in my text to you that I thought you would be at a three on this from the gameplay. But obviously hearing this review, you sound higher on it than a three. So for folks who don't know, the Dukes of Dice scale... We rate all games on it, one to six, one being bad, bad, very bad, six being good, good, very good. And Sean, I thought you would be at a three. Game is okay, not exciting. We'll play in the right situation. It sounds like you're you're higher on this than than that, though. Yeah, I think so. And I I had said maybe half jokingly at first that that the setup and having to build the board might be a, a full point drop. I, I don't think that's I don't think that's true. So so here's what I will say. Um, Raquel, <laughs> Raquel enjoyed it well enough, but she is not crazy about these spatial reasoning games and it was, it was rough and it's surprising because she, she does a lot of art. She does a lot of drawing. Um, you know, you would, you would think that, that that would be a bigger strength for her. I also am not particularly strong at these these types of games um there's there's more you know even even onitama um i'd like to think i'm i'm decent at but even that is is not necessarily my strength um so yeah we're not going to keep this game so i kind of have rory and i kind of have an arrangement with a lot of games where i'll take it home if i like it i'll buy it if not then i'll just kind of take it back and it'll be the the store copy and so I'm not going to have much of an opportunity to play it here. So it's going to go back to Empire. But once once we open the shop up for, um, you know, for Dukes of Dice Wednesday nights at some point, hopefully soon, I I would be more than happy to kind of play this as a warm up game. I I would really like to play this at three and four players. So with that being said, I'm going to give this, I'm going to give this a four, a good game. Worth playing just all the time belongs in the duchy. I, 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 like I said, this is, this feels like a really good, or at least would be in my speculation, a really good four player Onitama. So yeah, it's a four, Alex, a very, very solid four. When you mentioned Onitama, the one that came to mind actually, just because of the, the area control elements of this, uh, was Blokus. Yeah. Okay. I, I can see that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so I, I I mentioned earlier in this review the the fears I had that Abby wouldn't like this because it might feel too chess like. Turned out to be not a thing. Uh, it it didn't feel too chess like to her. She enjoyed the game, and she gave it on the Abby scale a uh, sure, which is a four basically on okay. on the Duke scale. Uh, I I am about in the same territory as well. 
so I gave this, I'm going to give this one a four. Good game worth playing. Just not all the time belongs in the duchy. It isn't going anywhere. Uh, there are some games that need to get culled from the collection, but this is not one of them. This is not one that's going to be departing anytime soon. And I will say this, Sean. It's on the higher side of a four. Not higher enough to give it a 4.5 or anything like that, but higher side. And I think if I have played this at a higher player count, come a year from now for the double take, mm-hmm. this could get as high as a five. This could get to the great territory. If it, wow. if it has that chaotic feel to it, if folks enjoy it, really get into the theme... Uh, the, the the replayability with the rivalry cards really adds a lot to this and the different yeah. feels of the game. I think that's a huge credit and a huge thing. And this three-dimensional thing just has a cool, playful element to it. There's something really beautiful in the presentation. It's a unique theme. Uh, I enjoy it. I don't think it's a fantastic or amazing two-player game. I think it's a good two-player game. And that's all, unfortunately, I was able to play it at. So uh, ultimately leave this one at a four, but I think on the double take, a good chance that it might creep up to a five. So that'll do it for the Duke's review of Holy Festival of Colors. Sean, with a slightly surprising, at least for me, four and a four from me, with a chance to go higher. You are listening to the Dukes of Dice, proud members of the Dice Tower Network. For other great shows in the network, check out Dicetowernetwork.com. Back to Alex and Sean for this week's Duke's Double Take. All right, Sean. Duke's Double Take time, and we're looking back at episode 217, and I think to myself, when we were talking about It's a Wonderful World, and Sean, at the time, you gave this one a provisional four. You were not Jones in to play it. You were not a fan of the, the Heritage Edition, the giant box you had of this, but you were intrigued, and you said that you were, and this is a direct quote, Committed to play through that campaign in its entirety. Oof. Oof. Who knew un- that, unfortunately enough, <laughs> uh, the realities of the world would make that commitment uh, impossible. Uh, I gave this one a 4.5. I said, for me, the Heritage Edition is a non-starter. There was just too much there, and I just mm-hmm. needed the smaller box. Uh, I thought it was closer to being great than good as a game, and I might even buy it, might even pick it up. Uh, the theme didn't excite me, though. The game itself was great. There are just some other little things that, that were holding it back. You predicted <laughs> that I would not have purchased nor played it since. I don't recall if I played it shortly after the review or not. I will tell you that at Miniature Market, when I've been there with Abby, <laughs> and we've seen this game on the shelf, it will pop out to her and it'll be like, oh, I, I like this one. Maybe we should get this one. And then I haven't actually pulled the trigger on getting it. There's something yeah. else that, that I want more in that moment. But it's persisted in, in my mind and in her mind as one, oh, yeah, this one was fun. We can pick it up. And certainly in the smaller retail size box, it's more palatable that way. But your prediction is dead right. I didn't purchase it. I haven't substantially played it since. Mm-hmm. Um, thoughts on the game haven't changed. I thought it was more likely to drift down to a four than go up to a five. I think that's where I'm ultimately going to lay lean on this one. It's a four. It's it's a that's a really good solid game, even probably closer to great. Uh, but again, not an exciting theme, and it just didn't quite get over that threshold of actually wanting to buy it. Uh, but it 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 remains uh, uh, fondly remembered in Abby's heart. And there's a chance that at some point we'll just if it if the price is low enough, we'll scoop up a copy, add it to the collection, and maybe my thoughts on it will change, and it might drift back up towards five territory. But for now. In all fairness, it's a four. What about you, Sean? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because it's it's a drafting game, a game that, uh, you know, a mechanic that I love. It's engine building. I love engine building. But there was just something, there was just something kind of soulless about the game. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Um, it wasn't offensive in any way, but it just, there was nothing that, that would draw me into the game. So I'm going to, I'm not going to drop it to a three game is okay. Not exciting. We'll play in the right situation. I'm going to leave it at my, at that four, a good game. Cause I think it is a good game. Um, I just think there's better engine builders, better drafting games, better combination of the two, uh, good game worth playing. Just all the time belongs to the duchy. I would certainly play it again. Did you play through the campaign? No, no, no. Did you play any part of the campaign? Uh, at, the, at the time of the review, we had, yeah. We'd played, I think, the first two scenarios of the campaign. If I okay. Correctly. 
Okay. That's not nothing. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a solid game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's fair enough. That, that is the nature of this. You get, you get so many, so many games. It's, it's hard to scoop them all up and there might not be anything inherently wrong with the game itself. It just may not have that next little bit that, that encourages it to, to stick around. So yeah. Uh, Brett Mowers on the guild. Uh, said that that they continue to enjoy this engine builder. Sad they missed the Kickstarter for the expansion. Although I will mention, Sean, we didn't talk about this. Uh, it's a Wonderful Kingdom. The uh, two-player implementation is coming on Kickstarter. And uh, that one was on the hotness for a good chunk of time when it was announced. So uh, keep an eye out for that one. I'd be curious how that one goes. And that might even be a future future review way in the, way in the distance. Uh, in any case, uh, Brett continues to say, we love chaining together the card building by taking advantage of the production timing. It's very satisfying when done right. With about six to eight plays under our belt at all player counts, it's fair to say that this is a keeper in our collection. If anything, seeing the same cards over and over is the only thing keeping it from the table more. The aforementioned expansion should help. A solid five for us. And then Nick McNabb says, It's a Wonderful World is one of my most played games for 2020. It plays well at all player counts with a good ad adaptation for two player with simple mechanics to teach, but plenty of interesting considerations to engage the brain. You really do need to choose who you play this with, though, as players who are prone to AP can slow the game down to a crawl as they consider all of the options every time they are handed cards. Similarly, if your players aren't too good at thinking two steps ahead, you can end up with some players scoring barely over single digits and others 70-plus points. And saying all of that, it's a solid five for me. And I remember seeing some pretty wide scores in this game. I, I was really good at this game. I had some really high scores. Like, I, I don't, I'm trying to remember. I, I think I had really high scores in this game. I did, I did really well. It seems like the kind of game that would work for your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Sylvain Lacroix says, on paper, I should really love this game. The engine building elements, the draft, and the whole game should be a home run for me. But in the end, every time I played, I enjoyed the game less and less. I ended up getting rid of it after six games, which is usually plenty of time to help me appreciate a game. I don't know why, I just don't have that much fun with it. Still a three for me, because it's not the game's fault, it's probably mine. Eh, fair enough. I, I certainly didn't find myself getting worn out by the game, but I also haven't felt uh, passionately enough to, to pick it up, so... That'll do it for the uh, the Duke's double take, Sean. It it. Oh, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, what, hold on. What? Holding on. So I'm, okay, I pulled this up. I was recording. I was recording stats on <laughs> on my my board game app. So in all of the plays, I had the top score at eighty two. Uh, the lowest score was Jared Quintana at twenty seven. The average winning score was seventy, and I'm looking here. Yeah, I won all of my plays. Wow, okay. Yeah. Worse for your brain. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Well, that will actually do it for the Duke's <laughs> double take, now that Sean's had a chance to brag. Uh, <laughs> goes from a provisional four to just a four for Sean, and from a four and a half for me down to closer to a four. That'll do it. But before we go, the best of the rest, the names we didn't pick for this episode, but could have. Uh, Sean, want to kick us off with some honorable mentions? Brett Mowers suggested Ascending engines which makes sense because you're ascending the floors in in uh in holy and then engine building from um it's a wonderful world yes the games we just talked about yep that you just them. forgot yep uh and also i think the, the concept in certainly it's a wonderful world of of the you know it's engine building, but yeah, it ramps. Well, okay. I literally just yes. almost redefined yes. engine building. Boy, that was equally that was equally dumb. All right. Uh, Francois Miley uh, came with powder coating system, kind of referencing uh, the systems and engine building and, and sort of the technology and It's a Wonderful World with the powder coating that you find in Holy. And then Jimmy DM90 suggested Color Me Empress instead of Impress, like, like the em an Empress. Um, yeah. Color and then what's wait what's the what's how's that tie in with its wonderful world? Man, I don't know. I just copy these sometimes. Well, great. Well, good job, Jimmy. D. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and look that up and and uh, pull up the guild thread 
while we're going through these remaining two names, and hopefully I can come up with a satisfying answer for you. I'm not just talking to stall for time while I load this tab, Sean. I'm actually about to jump right into the next name, which is <laughs> from Don Gilstrap. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky. That wasn't my best singing, but not terrible either. Probably terrible. <laughs> Uh, Don's explanation, colors being central to holy, the 3D nature of the game, and the fact that he can't think of It's a Wonderful World without thinking of Louis Armstrong's song. Also an opportunity for Alex to sing. Sorry, Don, I probably let you down with that one. My bad. Well, why don't, uh, you, why don't you carry on, Alex, to the last one? Well, the, I, so I was about to, but I will say I, I just magically happened to have the tab loaded for, for Jimmy DM90, and he oh, said perfect. a festival of hues meets empire building in It's a Wonderful World. Ah. Uh, okay. So there you go. Uh, all right, and Joshi and Gurr with I see trees of green, red roses too, referencing the colors in Holy and combining that with Wonderful World. So uh, nice names, good job, Guild, but uh, congrats again to the name father for adding another notch onto his naming belt. Yes, indeed. Well, all right, Alex, that's going to do it for us. That's episode 243 in the bag we're we're inching in on 250 there alex slowly but surely so thanks again steve o'rourke as you mentioned for naming this episode technicolor until next time this is sean and alex and duke you later everybody thank you so much for listening to the dukes of dice today's episode was recorded in the duchy on january 28th 2021 our theme music provided by Carbohydro M from his Prime Legacy album. The Dukes of Dice are a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. For other great board gaming podcasts, check out DiceTowerNetwork.com. And for all the days of the Dutchie, go to DukesOfDice.com. Find us on Twitter at Dukes of Dice. Join in conversations on our Board Game Geek Guild. Find us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks to our sponsors, Arcane Wonders and Game Toppers LLC. You can learn more about Game Toppers at GameToppersLLC.com and find out all you need to know about Arcane Wonders at ArcaneWonders.com. We'll see you back here in two weeks. Until then, game on.